Good morning and welcome to Yoker Evangelical Church. Whether you're watching this online or whether you're listening to a CD, uh, we are wanting to meet together as God's people today. Let me encourage you that uh, because of coronavirus, this is the only way that we can do church together, the only way that we can listen uh, to sermons from Yoker Evangelical Church uh, together. And so can I ask you to try and treat this as far as possible like church. Get yourself prepared like you were coming into, into this room on a Sunday morning. Uh, get your, your Bible uh, handy, have your Bible handy. Put your, uh, your phone far away. Just clear yourself of distractions and sit down and focus for the next half hour or so um, to, to meet with the living God. Can I also uh, just say that at the end of the sermon, there's going to be two questions uh, two questions on the sermon, and the idea of them is that you would be able to phone somebody else from the church and to discuss those questions, um, kind of recreating the tea and coffee time, recreating that fellowship that we enjoy uh, when we come to church on a Sunday morning. It might be worth saying as well that there's a couple of videos available on the YouTube channel uh, in the playlist, videos of hymns that you can uh, listen to and uh, even sing along with if you dare. Um, but before we go any further, let's pray together. Father God, we uh, come to you this morning and we come to you acknowledging that we are weak and needy. Father God, we come to you knowing that we don't know what's going on. Father, we're not in control and we feel it more than we ever do. Father, we know how vulnerable we are, how helpless we are. And so, Father, we want to come to you this morning and ask for your help. Father, we thank you so much that even although coronavirus has taken us by surprise, that has come out of the blue, that we never knew it was coming, it hasn't taken you by surprise. Father, you know the end from the beginning. You are the king of the universe. You're sovereign over all things. And we want to praise you that we today are safe in your hands. Father God, as we meet together today, we want to pray to you for our world. Father, first of all, we want to pray for those who are sick today, whether they're sick because of coronavirus or whether they're sick in some other way and are still suffering because uh, of the extra strain that's placed on our NHS today. Father God, we pray that you would be near to them. We pray that you would help them. Lord, we ask that you would reveal yourself and give people comfort and help at this time. And ultimately, Father, we ask that you would make them better. Father, as we pray for those who are sick, we want to pray for the NHS as well. Father, we pray for doctors and nurses who are working so hard just now, working such long hours. We ask, Father, that you'd be near to them. We ask that you would give them the energy that they need, that you would help them as they continue to serve others Father, please, would you make, be with them and comfort them. And Father, as we pray for the NHS staff, we also want to pray for our leaders, for our government. Lord, we thank you for the decisions that they've made up to this point. We thank you as they've attempted to lead this country through such a time of uncertainty. And Father, we ask that you would continue to help them. Father, give them reliable science, reliable studies that would help them to make good decisions. And Father, help them to make wise decisions, good decisions that will be for the good of the country and for the people. And finally, Father, we pray for our world. Never before have we seen such a global crisis which affects every country all over the world. And Father, we ask that at this time you would help us as a world uh, to care for one another, to serve one another. Lord, we ask that through this immense difficulty, through this pandemic, Lord, we ask for your grace, that you would be at work in human beings, bringing them to yourself, drawing them to you. And we ask, Father, that not only would people come to you, but that you would help us as well to love one another, to serve one another, not to be selfish, but to be selfless, just like you, Father, have been towards us as you sent your Lord Jesus into the world 
to save sinners. Father God, we ask for your help today. And as we come to look at your scriptures now, Lord, we ask that you would lead us and guide us and help us for the furtherance of your kingdom and for your glory. Amen. So we're now going to uh, turn to Luke's gospel. If you've uh, got a Bible in the house, you could pause the video and run and get it, or maybe you've got it nearby, near to hand, and you can uh, pick it up. But the passage that we're looking at this morning is just the next passage in Luke's gospel. But I hope that we'll see that it follows on very well uh, from all that we've been seeing in Luke's gospel, but also speaks into the very situation that we're in today. So we're reading from Luke chapter 5, from verse 12, all the way through to verse 32. And I encourage you again, please follow along in your Bibles. It says, While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their illnesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. One day, Jesus was teaching and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal those who were ill. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Immediately, he stood up in front of them took what he had been lying on and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples. Why do you eat, with, eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. To repentance. Amen. So as we turn back to Luke's gospel and Luke chapter 5 and verse 12, I'm wanting to ask you a question today. And it's not really a difficult question. I imagine that the majority of us would answer the question in the same way. What is the most, the biggest problem? What is the biggest problem facing humanity today? What is the biggest problem facing the world today? Now, I would be shocked if you are not immediately thinking coronavirus. If that's not the first thought into your head, I don't know where you've been. 
But as we turn to Luke's gospel here, we're going to see different people who think that they know what their biggest problem is. But as they come to Jesus, he's eager to show them that actually their biggest problem is something else entirely. Now, I don't want to belittle the difficulties that coronavirus are bringing upon us. Not at all. I know how worried we all are. I know that many are even panicking. And and for lots of good reasons. We're very worried about our health. We're very worried about food. We're very worried about our families. We're worried about our jobs. Ultimately, I suppose, we're worried about death. Our own death or the death of our loved ones. These are serious concerns that we all have. I want to suggest to you today that there's actually a bigger problem facing you. A bigger problem facing humanity. And that is our sin. Our rebellion against God and our separation from Him. And as we look at this passage, we'll see lots of people who come to Jesus thinking that they know what their biggest problem is. And Jesus is eager to show them that they have a bigger problem still. Now, as we turn back to Luke's gospel, if you were either in church last week or if you've listened uh, to last week's sermon, you'll know that last week Jesus had given some fishermen a miraculous catch of fish. Peter and his pals had caught more fish than they'd ever caught before. And at the end of it, they realized there was something special about Jesus. And Jesus said to them, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And these first disciples went and followed Jesus, went with him. And as we join the story today, we see that Jesus and and his disciples, we would assume, are now in one of the towns. And as they're walking through this town, a man comes to them. We're not told his name, we're just told that he was a man covered with leprosy. And he comes to Jesus and begs him for help. Now as I see it, this man with leprosy is facing two major problems. A physical problem and a spiritual problem. So first of all, his physical problem. Now, leprosy today is a very uh, precise and and defined disease. But leprosy in Jesus' day was any serious defiling skin disease. It could be of many different varieties, but it had to be severe. It wasn't just like a rash, like eczema. It had to have like open sores. It had to have uh, lesions and, and real horrible skin disease. And so this man is suffering with one of these skin diseases. A serious problem. And in terms of its physical problem, I'm positive that it would have caused him great discomfort. His clothes would have stuck to the, to the sores. It would have caused him great pain as well. There were serious physical problems that this man was facing. But as well as those physical problems, he was also facing a spiritual problem, a social problem. Problem, And to understand that, we need to go back to the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament. You can turn with me or you can uh, just keep your finger in, in Luke 5. But in Leviticus chapter 13, verse 45, it says there, Anyone with such a defiling disease must wear torn clothes, let their hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of their face and cry out, Unclean! Unclean! As long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone. They must live outside the camp. That was the social problem that faced someone with leprosy. They had to wear certain clothes. They had to let their hair hang down. They had to call out unclean. They had to stay outside the camp. They weren't allowed to come into markets. They weren't allowed to go to the synagogue or the temple to worship God. They were unclean. They were outside. They weren't allowed to come Towards people, they weren't allowed to come towards God. This man was facing a physical problem and a spiritual, social problem. Social in the sense he couldn't come to people or God. But this man comes to Jesus. And as he comes to Jesus, he's looking for physical healing. We're told of him coming to Jesus. I wonder if you can imagine him in some dusty town, coming with his torn clothes and his hair all unkempt and hanging over his face. And he comes to Jesus with the sores on his hand, maybe his face, who knows what he looked like. And he comes to Jesus and he falls on his face before Jesus and he says to him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. The man knows that Jesus is 
able to heal him. But he doesn't know if he's willing to heal him. He says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, what happens next, I find amazing. Now, remember, this man was unclean, a social outcast, torn clothes, dirty, hair unkempt, big sores and lesions on his arms and legs and face, not been touched by another human being for weeks, months, maybe years. And Jesus could have spoken the words, be healed, and the man would have been clean. But Jesus, in his wonderful way, reaches out and touches the man. Do you see that in verse 13? Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And we're told immediately the leprosy left him. It was gone. As soon as Jesus touched him and said the words, be clean, the man was clean. And then Jesus isn't just concerned for his physical health. He's also concerned for his spiritual health. And he says to the man, he orders him, don't tell anyone But go, show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. He says to the man, it's not enough for you just to be physically clean. You need to be spiritually clean too. So you need to take the sacrifices that are ordered in the Old Testament by Moses. You need to take them to the temple. You need to offer them to the priest and he will pronounce you clean and you will be brought back into society and back into the congregation of God's people. You need to be physically and spiritually clean. We're told that even though Jesus told this man not to tell anybody, yet news of him continued to spread all over. And many, many people, crowds of people, came to hear what Jesus had to say and came to be healed by Jesus too. But we're told that Jesus withdrew to lonely places and prayed to God. It's a wee bit of a strange thing to do for Jesus, but it shows us that actually his main purpose in being here wasn't to heal people physically. He had a bigger purpose in mind, and we'll see that as we go on. The next story that we find is when Jesus forgives the paralytic. Jesus forgives the paralytic. Now, I know that Many of us are in Glasgow. Some of us may be in different places, but many of us are in Glasgow. And in Glasgow, paralytic means something else entirely. And so I need to, first of all, assure you that when I say that this man was a paralytic, he wasn't able to walk, but not because he'd been drinking. He wasn't able to walk because his legs didn't work. He was a paralyzed man. He was a paralytic. And Jesus forgives his sin is what we're going to see. This paralyzed man, Jesus forgives his sin. So in this day, Jesus was teaching. And many had come to hear him, do you remember? And Pharisees and teachers of the law had also gathered to hear Jesus teach. We're told that they came from all the different regions in Galilee. We're even told that they came from Jerusalem, from the capital. They're all coming to hear. What does this new religious teacher have to say? To assess him, to judge him, to see to see who he is and what he says. And they're sitting listening to Jesus' teaching. I imagine them with arms crossed listening to see if he says anything wrong. And into this scene, the, the camera then switches to this paralyzed man, this paralytic, and his friends carrying him on a mat. They're desperate to get their friend to Jesus. They know that this paralyzed man who is unable to walk, if they can get him to Jesus, Jesus is able and willing to make him better and make him able to walk. And so they go to extraordinary lengths to get this man to Jesus. They lay him on a mat and they they carry him to the house where Jesus is. And when they get to the house, they find a house that's totally stowed out. There's no room at all. There's people standing even outside the doors and outside the windows. There's no way in to get to Jesus. But these friends aren't deterred by that. But when they see that they can't get to Jesus in a normal way, they come up with a pretty ingenious plan. In those days in Palestine, they would have had stairs up the side of the house onto the roof. And so these pals, get these friends get their mate, I don't know if they put him on his shoulders or carried him, but they carry him up the steps onto the roof of the house. And we're told that they then start digging through the roof. We're not told what the owner of the house was thinking at this time, but they start digging through the roof to make an opening 
tells you that they dig through the tiles and they would have had to dig through clay and mud and different things to try and get in. You imagine if you were inside the house, you're listening to Jesus teaching and then you start hearing this scratching from above you. Perhaps bits of dust start to float down as this roof has been torn open. The odd clump of clay might have fallen at Jesus' feet. And eventually a hole appears and maybe a man's head pops through. And the space gets opened wider and wider and wider until it's big enough that you can lower a man, a whole man, down through the roof. And he lands at Jesus' feet right in front of him. The friends have succeeded in their task. They have got their mate to Jesus. And now the big moment, the moment that they've been waiting for, the moment where Jesus is going to heal him and make him walk. And Jesus turns to the man, he looks down at him on the ground and he says to him, friend, your sins are forgiven. Can you imagine? Imagine his friends on the roof looking down going, no, Jesus, we brought him to you because he needs his legs healed. He can't walk. Why are you healing his sin? He needs his legs fixed. We're not told what the men on the roof thought. We're not told what the the group of people gathered thought. But we are told what was going on inside the head of the Pharisees and the religious teachers. As they heard Jesus say, friend, your sins are forgiven. They weren't thinking, it's strange that he hasn't healed his legs. They were thinking, who is this who is blaspheming? Who is this who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? That's what they were thinking. They were thinking, how dare he say to this man, your sins are forgiven? Only God has authority to forgive sins. He's blaspheming. He's taking the glory of God on himself, a man, and saying, I have authority to forgive sins. Now, they didn't say that out loud, but that's what they were thinking. And Jesus knew in his heart and knew that that was what they were thinking. And so he turned to them and he addressed them. And did you see what he says? He says to them, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Why are you thinking these things? And then he gives them a question. He says, which is easier? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say to this paralyzed man, stand up and walk? And you can see what Jesus is doing here. He's wanting them to, to be thinking, well, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because there's no evidence. There's no way to know whether you can or you can't. But if you say rise up and walk, well, then it will be obvious for all of us. That's what's going on inside, inside their heads. And then Jesus says, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. I wonder if you can imagine this paralyzed man standing up for the first time on his legs, picking up his mat, rolling it up, sticking it on his shoulder or under his arm, and then having to squeeze through all these people as he leaves. And he's praising God the whole way, going, I can walk! And everybody's praising God, saying, we've seen amazing things today. But I wonder whether people missed Jesus' main point. The main thing that he was trying to communicate to them wasn't that he could heal the man's legs. Everybody knew already that he could heal. The main thing that Jesus is communicating here is that he can forgive sins. That he can wash people clean by forgiving their sins and present them holy before God. That's what he's come to do. That's what he wants people to know. That then brings us on to our third and final story. And in this third story, we see the call of Levi. Now, as this story progresses, we see Levi sitting at tax collector's booth. And we know from other Gospels, from Matthew chapter 9, that Levi is, in fact, Matthew. He's the disciple called Matthew. And we see in this story that Levi is sitting at a tax booth, which to us doesn't sound very significant, but for the people of the time, it was extremely significant. Because in Jesus' day, a tax collector was the most hated of all people. In Jesus' day, a tax collector represented a traitor. Someone who had gone over to the Romans, who was collecting taxes from the Jews and giving them to the Romans, working for the occupying authority. And this tax collector, Levi, 
was sitting at his tax booth, collecting in the money, and Jesus, with his disciples, is walking past, and he says to Levi, follow me. And we're told in Luke's gospel that Levi got up, left everything, and followed Jesus. He turned his back on his previous life. He repented of everything that he had done, and he followed Jesus. Then we're told that Levi goes and throws a great banquet in his house. He invites all of his friends, all the other tax collectors, all his pals, and he gets them all together to a meal where Jesus is the guest of honor. He does this because he wants his friends to meet Jesus. And they celebrate this meal together. They enjoy feasting together. And he gets an opportunity to introduce his friends to Jesus. But we're told whether it's just after that or whether it's the next day, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law come to Jesus' disciples and ask him, what do you think you're doing? They say to them, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? They say to them, you, you're religious teachers. You're not meant to hang around with those low people, sinners, low sinful people. You are meant to be above that. Now, they come to Jesus' disciples, but it's not them who answer them. It's, it's Jesus himself. He turns to them and he says to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. He says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He says, just like you wouldn't take a doctor to someone who is well, you don't bring Jesus to someone who is righteous. That's not why he's come. He says, those who think they're righteous have nothing to gain from Jesus. Only those who know that they're sinful. He's come to call the sinful to repentance. Sinners to come to him to be washed clean of their sin, to be forgiven. That's why Jesus came. And we see in Levi a perfect example. This man who is living this sinful life, working for the Roman occupying authorities, wrapped up in all sorts of other things in this society, and he turns his back on it all, repents, and turns and follows Jesus. So as we seek to apply this to ourselves, we want, need to think, what does this passage say to us today? And if you're not yet a Christian, if you're listening to this or watching this and you're not yet a believer in the Lord Jesus, then I know that today your primary concern, your biggest worry is coronavirus. That's the thing that's consuming your mind. You're thinking, how do I get food? How do I look after my family? What about my job? What about my money? What about this? But I want to say to you today that just like the leper, just like that paralyzed man, there's something bigger, a bigger concern for you today. The bigger concern is your sin that keeps you from God, that cuts you off from Him, your rebellion against your Creator. And today I want to urge you to come to Him, to ask Him for help, to ask Him for forgiveness, to repent as Levi does and to turn from your sin and to be made whole. And if today you are a Christian, if you're watching this and you've been following Jesus for a week or 70 years, I want you to know that you can trust Jesus with your problems today. As you face coronavirus and all the different difficulties, you can trust Jesus today. You know that he was able and willing to deal with your biggest problem of your sin. You know that he was able and willing to wash you clean, to forgive you and to present you holy before God. Will you not trust him to help you in this situation? In this moment with coronavirus, you can trust him. Will you trust him? Secondly, how can you tell others about him? How can you invite your friends to know Jesus? It's unlikely that you're going to be able to dig through a roof and lower your friend down to Jesus' feet. And also just now because of coronavirus, you can't even invite your friends over to have a meal to tell them about Jesus. But there are lots of things that you can do. You can write a letter explaining how much you care for someone and love them and are thinking of them just now and, and telling them of the hope that you have. You can link to things on Facebook. There's so many things in social media that you can do. Or you can simply just phone somebody. Ask them how they are and genuinely listen. Listen to their concerns, their worries. And then 
Share with them the hope that you have, how you're coping in this time with the Lord Jesus at your side. So as we finish, let me just encourage you to be like the people in this story. To be like the leper who knows his need and comes to Jesus asking for help. To be like the paralyzed man who comes seeking help and receiving forgiveness of sins. And finally, be like, be like Levi, Matthew, the one who turned his back on all that he had in his life, repented of everything in his life, walked away from the tax booth and followed Jesus, inviting all of his friends to a banquet so that he could tell them more about his Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus. So let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for this story. We thank you for the different uh, things that we have encountered, all these different people with their different struggles, their different worries, their different problems. And we see them all coming to Jesus thinking that they know what they need and finding that Jesus knows that they have an even greater need. And Father, as we come to you today and pray to you because of coronavirus and all the worries that come along with it, Father, we want to acknowledge before you that we have a greater need. Father, we ask that you would forgive us our sins. We ask that you would wash us clean and bring us before you pure and spotless as only you can. Father, please help us to minister to friends and family, to tell them of who you are and what you've done and of the hope that is available to them in the Lord Jesus. Father, please help us to be faithful to you, to love and serve you as we love and serve others at this time. For we ask it through the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. So I have two questions for you to discuss with your friends. Phone them and just discuss this. Someone else who's listened to this sermon. The first is, I said that the biggest problem facing humanity today is our sin. Do you agree? Why or why not? And try and give three reasons uh, for your answer. And then secondly, think of one way that you can tell people who don't know Jesus about the hope and joy that you have in him. May God bless you in this week ahead.